Okay. Well, welcome. And thank you for attending the Colorado Office of Natural Medicine stakeholder meeting via webinar today. The date is September 25th, 2024, and it is 10.03 a.m. Before we get started, we would like to introduce the staff members from the Division of Professions and Occupations that are present. My name is Nate Brown. I'm the regulatory analyst for the division. Also attending are Lori Bratton, program director for natural medicine, and Maria Rascona Rana, a regulatory coordinator. The division has transitioned to a platform that is 100% virtual. We appreciate your flexibility. As many of you have been to DORA stakeholder meetings before, we would like to reiterate the importance of your comments today. DORA makes decisions every day that may affect your life and your business. So your input is vital in the rulemaking process. Throughout this process, our goal is to create regulations that clarify and explain legislation, ensure minimum competency to enter and continue practice and profession, and provide only what is absolutely necessary for consumer protection without creating unnecessary barriers to the marketplace. Your input will be part of the information that goes to the director as it considers adopting revisions to the rules. More specifically, today we will receive feedback regarding proposed revisions to rules 2.1, 2.2, 2.5, 2.6, 2.7, 2.8, 2.9, 3.2, 3.3, 4.1, 5.3, 5.4, 6.3, 6.4, 6.5, 6.6, 6.9, 6.14, 6.15, 6, 6.17, 6.18, 8.1, and 8.2. Additionally, we're looking at proposed additions to rules 1.4, 5, and 6. The purpose of the proposed revisions is to clarify and simplify the rules, correct clerical errors, and address public safety concerns. This meeting is being recorded and will be posted on the program's website by the close of business tomorrow. As this stakeholder meeting is held solely by webinar, please raise your hand by using the hand icon if you would like to speak. We will unmute, or unmute your line so you will be heard by everyone. Or you can type your comment into the question section and we will read it aloud. Before we start taking comments, I want to ask that everyone providing comments, please state your name and the name of the organization that you represent, if any. Uh, feel free to provide either general comments on the rule changes or specific comments proposed language. Please limit your comments to no more than three minutes. There will be a timer on screen so you can uh, easily track how much time you have remaining. And try not to repeat something that was already said. Stating you're in full agreement with someone else works just fine and will be noted. Uh, and just some other general housekeeping matters. If you're using the audio through your computer, please remember to put any phones on vibrate or turn them off. And whether you are using computer or phone audio, try to keep background noises to a minimum when speaking. Okay, so with that, why don't we go ahead and get started? Looks like we already have some folks with their hands raised. So why don't we go ahead and start with Scott Bannon. And I'm just going to uh, apologize right up front um, if I mispronounce anybody's name. But uh, Scott, you should be able to speak as soon as you are muted. Please go ahead, you'll have three minutes. All right, thank you, Nate. Um, I'm Scott Shannon, a psychiatrist. I've worked in Colorado for 34 years. And I'd first like to thank the DORA board and staff for their efforts over the last year, year and a half. As a prior DORA board member, I know not only how important this is, but how time consuming and difficult it can be. So thank you. I wanted to comment uh, some about the sections on the practicum and also on consultation. My background is that I've been involved in psychedelic research for eight years. I've been involved in six different FDA approved psychedelic studies and um, practicing in Northern Colorado, have participated in or supervised over 7,000 uh, ketamine-assisted psychotherapy sessions done in a psychedelic model. Um, I work with PRADI, Psychedelic Research and Training Institute, a nonprofit, as a faculty member. 
And uh, as part of that, we've trained hundreds of physicians and therapists, psychologists over the last four years in the psychedelic method using ketamine. I wanted to speak to the practicum, and um, I support the uh, engaging the practicum earlier in the didactics as proposed. I think that is a lovely idea, and I think it makes great sense in terms of pedagogy. Um, I also support opening up locations for practicums as proposed to include clinical trial sites as we've been one. And I think this is probably one of the best ways to get people clinical experience, but also retreat settings and internationally. But I wanted to focus primarily one of the, um, my comments on the consultation. I think requiring 200 hours of experience with psilocybin in the startup of the program is not practical and will create a major limitation for the program. I would suggest that um, it be reduced to perhaps 100 hours and include other medications that use the psychedelic framework. As the framework is the critical piece, the medications can change without dramatically changing the um, training opportunity. So I would recommend including ketamine, not an infusion model, but ketamine-assisted model, MDMA, DMT, LSD, et cetera. And I would encourage that for a transitional period of two, two years. I've been involved in certification process for specialties in medicine, and I know that this transitional period is challenging. The other piece that I would like to say is that 50 hours of consultation in the first six months is impractical. I think increasing that to two years is much better for professional development and education. And I'd also recommend that it be divided to um, peer support, half of that, and uh, otherwise engaged consultants. Thank you. I apologize about that song. I'm not sure why it defaulted <laughs> to that, that sound, but uh, I apologize for the uh, Oscars style playoff there. Um, but uh, please finish up your last thought, um, Mr. Shannon, if, if, you, if you'd like. Oh, no, just uh, thank you for the opportunity to comment. And I, I think we're moving in the right direction with these changes. And I just support the changes both to practicum and consultation to make it more um, uh, functional and also to improve the flow of providers through this program so that more don't move underground if they become too burdensome. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, sir. Let's see. Next up, you have uh, Natasha Poinsett. Your hand is up. You should be able to unmute. Please go ahead when you're ready. You will have three minutes. Thank you. Um, my name is Natasha Poinsett. I am uh, the Colorado Director with the Healing Advocacy Fund. And uh, I want to comment in support of the comments just made by Dr. Scott Shannon regarding the consultation requirement and um, specifically with a concern at the onset of the program that there will be a shortage of people that not only have that experience, but in particular have the capacity to show proof of those 200 hours working with psilocybin given its illegal status until recently. And uh, definitely agree that that should be expanded to the other uh, psychedelic assisted therapy options, and then also um, maybe come into place a couple years down the road when more people have been able to operate in the licensed and regulated model for the consultation piece. And then um, we do have some concerns about the addition of the required consultation period of uh, 10 to 20 hours on top of continuing education. I absolutely appreciate the intent there to ensure that practitioners are getting a, a depth of a, a consultation that's ongoing, um, but a little bit concerned about uh, piling on the costs on top of all the other fees um, and requirements. And so just advocate for considering a little bit more flexibility um, in terms of the balance between continuing education requirements and continuing consultation requirements. And we'll send in some written comments with some suggestions there. Um, and then uh, I also want to advocate that observation of in-person sessions be permitted towards the 30 hours of required in-person experience in the practicum. And um, I'm 
this is because sorry, I know you're trying to find where I am commenting on. Um, this is because um, in Oregon currently, facilitate uh, students are not allowed to directly facilitate during their practicum. So if we want Oregon practicum hours to count in Colorado right now, we need to allow observation as an option and not just facilitation. Um, so uh, I think that again, that that's something that could be changed down the road, but I believe that Dora's intent is to allow Oregon practicums to be an option. And then um, in regards to the practicum sites that are allowed, encourage Dora to clearly spell out what sites are allowed in addition to a licensed healing center. Um, because right now it just states any licensed healing center can serve as a practicum site. I know that there are uh, training programs that have practicum sites internationally, including in jurisdictions where psilocybin is legal. Um, so I think it would be beneficial to spell out that that is also an option if it's run by an approved training program. And then also um, specify whether training programs in Colorado can operate a practicum at a location other than a licensed healing center in the authorized uh, location category. That's all for now. And I may raise my hand again. Thank you. Appreciate the time. Thank you so much. Uh, your comments are always appreciated. And uh, we can certainly circle back to folks if, um, if we have, have time here once we get through everybody who would like to speak. Next up, um, and again, I will apologize for butchering anybody's name, but uh, Will Van Der Veer, you should be able to unmute. Please go ahead. You'll have three minutes. Thank you. Uh, good job on the pronunciation. Well, that was quite accurate. Um, All right. <laughs> so I'm Dr. Will Van Der Veer. I'm a psychiatrist. Uh, I've been in practice in Colorado for over 20 years. Uh, like Dr. Shannon, I've been involved in clinical trials of uh, MDMA-assisted therapy uh, for chronic uh, PTSD uh, right here in Colorado. Um, I'm a co-founder of the Integrative Psychiatry Institute, where we are one of the licensed trainings here. So um, I, I share Dr. Shannon's concerns uh, about two things. One, the 200 hours of psilocybin in order to qualify to become a supervisor at the at the outset of this program is really going to limit the amount of people um, who can provide that supervision. Um, and I think um, Scott, Dr. Shannon's proposal for including other medicines as valid uh, experience leading into competency to provide supervision is uh, is a great solution at least for a period of time you know his proposal of two years makes sense to me um there will come a time where people have 200 hours of psilocybin but we just don't have that right now it's going to be a big bottleneck in training and certification uh, the second thing is um previously these rules a previous draft had the supervision requirement of 50 hours ranging from anywhere from six months to two years uh, I thought that made sense. I don't think um, the new draft saying that all 50 hours have to be done in the first six months makes sense. Uh, two hours a week of supervision, first of all, is burdensome um, to uh, busy therapists who are trying to you know, uh, run their practices in addition to doing their supervision. Number two, uh, there, there won't be enough experience with providing psilocybin sessions in six months to get the full benefit of those 50 hours of supervision. Uh, and finally, um, I agree that uh, with Dr. Shannon that some kind of um, composition of peer support combined with um, meeting with an approved uh, consultant makes makes a lot of sense. So... I'll save some time for someone else. Um, that's all I wanted to say. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your comments. Next up, I see, um, again, apologize for mispronouncing anybody's name, but uh, Jimmy Smurs, you should be able to unmute. Please go ahead when you're ready. You'll have three minutes. <laughs> Uh, 
All right, sorry, uh, one second. Uh, thank you, honorable members of DORA. My name is James Smurz. I represent myself. Um, I have a news and media company called Site4. My background includes a finance degree and uh, expertise in financial forecasting. Um, I also understand the economic principles that as far as the demand for psilocybin, which is crucial to this discussion. Um, my first issue is that uh, my testimony is aimed at the definition in the section uh, 1.4 of what a consultant is. Um, I long ago determined that I would not be profitable working as a guide in the industry. And so I believe this uh, just came up as far as this. Now, psilocybin has the most elastic demand among any Schedule One substance. And what we're seeing across the country with cultivation trends and an increased proficiency of being able to grow is that, you know, mushrooms are all over this country right now. And every day that is decreasing the de demand for services in Colorado and Oregon. Um, also the impact of the Massachusetts ballot needs to be noted as the upcoming results will pose a significant threat to the demand for Colorado's program, especially among residents of the Northeast. Um, we've seen a lot of this demographic come in and they tend to be less price sensitive and currently the most profitable people who are using the gray underground market in Colorado. Um, I also wanna present a warning. Um, in my financial opinion, Oregon's program has become and most likely will remain financially insolvent. Um, over the trailing past 10 weeks, the program has only brought in about $39,000. Um, originally, the Oregon program was based on the Healing Advocacy Fund's forecast of 90,000 clients in the first year that would require uh, about 2,200 facilitators. Um, the Oregon Health Authority hired 29 full-time employees, and that results in a annual budget of about $3.1 million. Um, they did have to receive a uh, $3.1 million bailout last year in July. Um, I've reviewed numerous plans since the inception of Prop 122, and I cannot see a business that is financially viable of any of the licensed natural medicine businesses outside of the training programs. Um, the biggest reason for this is the rejection of uh, MDMA from the FDA. Um, this really impacted the entire psychedelic ecosphere and all kinds of money has been pulled out. Uh, also, Colorado had an opportunity with HB 221344, which would have allowed it to very easily transition into MDMA. Um, so I believe that DOR and DORA need to be properly staffed to protect not only you know, people using um, the Colorado Natural Medicine Program, but the entire international industry. Um, I have submitted a number of proposed recommendations for appropriate funding, um, but my main recommendation for this is that the definition of consultant should be revised to prevent regulatory capture of a standard definition and ensure a broader range of professionals can contribute to their expertise to benefit Colorado and nat the natural medicine program. The term consultant has maintained a common definition since its origins in 16th century Latin, and this new and oddly specific definition should be given a new name. I appreciate the time and for considering these insights. Excellent, thank you so much for your comments. Appreciated, uh, as always. Next up, I see uh, Dan McCombie. Uh, you, you should be able to unmute. Please go ahead when you're able, and you'll have three minutes. Hi. Uh, thank you, Nate. Thank you, Dora's staff. I'll echo what other folks said. I deeply appreciate the diligence and consideration and thoughtfulness that it's clear that you're all bringing to this. And um, we really appreciate just some of the spirit and intent of these rules. Um, I know this is a big lift to bring something like this to public and also to learn from the lessons that have been experienced in Oregon. Um, I am actually currently in Oregon setting up one of our practicum here, so I very much understand that. I'm the director of product affluence. I'm a licensed mental health counselor. Some of my other colleagues are here. We're in the process of finalizing a submission for a training program in Colorado. 
Uh, we will be submitting written commentary and it's been hard to track everything everyone's been sharing, but I am largely in support of and agreement with what's been stated so far. So I'm going to use my time to speak to something that I think may be a somewhat novel addition to this. I wanted to comment on the potential revisions to the practicum requirements. And obviously those are significant and far reaching. And I think the spirit of these is really well intended and we overall agree with. I wanted to highlight a concern that we are facing, which is that currently, you know, our intention in the long term is to deliver practicum experiences where um, facilitators in training are cited at healing centers and are able to actually work individually, similarly to I did in graduate school, getting my experience towards my degree, where they're actually they have a supervisor, they're on site, they're basically it's an internship, effectively similar structure. As I think we can all imagine, that's going to be very difficult to achieve upfront due to a variety of factors, including the number of approved healing centers and the volume of clientele, which leaves the main option to be uh, group retreats, which we are planning to offer. And we're, we're speaking with um, folks about collaboration there. And for that model to work, that's also going to require some level of students receiving dosing. And the main thing that I wanted to comment on here is we do have a concern about the, just the volume and the capacity to do that and the removal of the, um, what's been called the alternative practicum as an option. Uh, we agree with the spirit of that, but we think that removing that um, or only allowing it to be 10 hours in the, in the near term could create a big backlog and problem with meeting practicum uh, volume and training the number of students for practicum required. We would like to suggest an offer, and we'll submit this as written commentary, that a temporary, and I, say, I want to repeat, temporary allowance of more, if not all, of the 40 hours of the practicum be allowed to be through observation of recorded video or other approved circumstances. We would suggest that this potentially be open only to folks applying for clinical licenses because of the depth of their experience, and that this be a temporary allowance for the year 2025. We'll submit more, but I think this will allow programs like ours and others that are maybe on the smaller size to really meet the needs of this program and to serve the students in a way that gets them really quality experience that we have a depth of background doing in our programs of drug developers. Thank you for your time and for hearing me out. Thank you so much for your, for your comments. Next up, I see uh, Shannon Hughes. Let's hand up, should be able to unmute. Uh, please go ahead, we'll have some minutes. Thank you so much. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to offer some commentary. I um, echo everybody else before me and just really appreciate this lift. And I know we're kind of building the ship as it sails in some respects. And so lots of little clarifications and details. And so yeah, I appreciate everyone's work and um, perspectives um, here. Um, so I'm, I'm Dr. Shannon Hughes. I'm a a co-founder and director of Elemental Psychedelics, which is a, an approved training program here in Colorado. We're a small program. Our cohorts are about 25 students. Um, and then I also um, uh, am an owner, co-owner of a mental health private practice here in uh, Fort Collins. And so we've been providing mental health services to the community for a number of years now also. Um, and so I just wanted to say, yes, I agree with uh, Dr. Scott Shannon and Dr. Will Vandeveer and Tasha and um, many of the comments that um, came before. And I, you know, regarding practicum, um, I just wanted to kind of give an example of, you know, at Elemental, we've been doing um, trainings for therapists and nurse practitioners and physicians for several years now um, doing uh, ketamine assisted therapy. And so, you know, we use retreat centers for our trainings um, because retreat centers often have. Um, large group spaces, they have accommodations where people can stay overnight. And so we can have our experiential training in the psychedelic therapy model um, and use ketamine. And, you know, we have a temporary uh, site where we can conduct a training. And so as far as practicum sites and authorized locations, I just wanted to like further reiterate, like it, the, the, I think the need to like define authorized locations is like, you know, temporary locations used for, you know, approved training programs for the purpose of offering practicum, as an example, some language um, that could be sort of further clarified um, in that definition. 
Um, and then, you know, I, I, I don't know if I'm under the authorized locations that will also include, you know, retreat centers. I know private residences are kind of carved out in certain circumstances, um, existing healthcare facilities and mental health clinics, um, or, you know, could be like temporary locations, you know, where they're not, there's not going to be a natural medicine services more than, you know, a handful of times a year. Um, and so I'll, I'll submit that as written comments also, but I think it would just be really, really useful to have some additional clarification around these authorized locations term. Um, and then I guess as far as consultation goes, I agree with everybody. So I won't repeat, um, I won't repeat what's already been said, but I really agree that this, the new uh, definition of uh, having at least 200 hours of natural medicine services is just very restrictive and probably unworkable at the start of the program. Um, and so opening that up to folks who have um, ketamine assisted therapy, MDMA assisted therapy, also natural medicine experience, although I'm not sure how still um, DOR is wanting people to demonstrate and document um, those hours. That's kind of a remaining question, but I'm supportive of what everybody else said, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to, to provide some comments here. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, appreciate appreciate everybody's comments. It's very, very helpful to us. Um, next up, I see uh, Kylie House. You should be yes. to unmute Hi. the last three minutes. Please go ahead. Okay. Hi. Thank you. Um, as I really appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Uh, I just wanted to um, again, echo what some of the other people here have been um, discussing about the consultation requirements. Um, and I'm hoping to use my um, personal history as an example of why this might be prohibitive um, and might go against the spirit of what we're trying to intend here. Uh, so I'm, uh, my name's Dr. Kylie House, and I'm a psychiatrist, and I've been involved in the psychedelic sphere for, since I've gotten out of residency, and that includes hours of, of both being a ketamine therapist, um, being involved in MDMA therapy, um, and also LSD therapy, uh, and uh, I'm an MDMA supervisor. I am a um, Schedule One license holder for 5-MeO DMT. And um, when I'm seeing what I'm seeing with this consultation requirement of the uh, 200 hours and having to um, prove your experience over the past five years in natural with natural medicine services, um, my concern is that um, I I at this point don't feel um, safe or comfortable doing that. Um, but I do feel that I'm qualified to provide consultation services. And so um, I just wanted to, again, use my um, personal experience as an example. And um, yeah, I appreciate your time. I'm not going to belabor this point, but thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate your comments. And I apologize for not using um, anybody's uh, honorifics, uh, doctor, for example. Um, but I do see that uh, we do actually have a Dr. Hannah McLean signed up to you have your hand raised. And you should be able to go. Uh, go ahead, please. Uh, go ahead. Thank, you have you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so I just presented in Vermont at a conference and I um, put my white coat on for the first time in 10 years and said, we're <laughs> women, women should use doctor more because uh, we're not introduced as doctor as much as men are. So. Um, I decided to put that in front of my name today. So I am Dr. Hannah McLean. Uh, my uh, qualifications are I have a uh, public health degree from Harvard. I have an MD from Brown and I have a, um, I did residencies in neurology and occupational medicine at Penn. I did patient safety fellowship for two years at the VA in Pennsylvania. Um, and um, also in psychoanalytically trained, which is a five-year training program. Um, I have been training, um, we were the, one of the first training programs to come up with a one-year training curriculum. Um, I think our curriculum may have even been used to submit for Measure 109 um, approval in Oregon, uh, because we were the only ones that had a one-year training that included licensed and unlicensed facilitators at that time. Um, and we have been training many cohorts. We uh, don't have a huge class. Usually it's 50 to 85 per year. Um, it's 250 hours. Um, 
We also have been doing trainings uh, internationally with psilocybin and um, I run a ketamine assisted psychotherapy clinic in Philadelphia, which was actually the first um, psychedelic therapy clinic on the Eastern seaboard <laughs> back in the day. Um, we don't do infusions. We do uh, what Scott Shannon was describing as the lozenges and we do IM as well. So it's a very much a psychedelic assisted therapy model. Um, so I have a few things I wanted to comment on today. Um, I agree with, uh, almost everything that Scott Shannon and Will Vanderveel said, including um, that I do believe that ketamine should count for, I mean, I would, I would say ketamine should count for even the practicum, but I know that may not be really open, um, but for the hours afterwards, um, a lot of people will be trying to get hours and I find ketamine to be a very useful um, tool to learn on. And it's the skills that um, transfer very easily to psilocybin. And sometimes it's even the best thing to start with. Um, for beginners. Um, I also agree that um, there should be flexibility with zoning and, and just the use. Um, so if we can make sure that, you know, something's out as a uh, medical clinic, that it could be flexible use or residential as much as possible, because I, I do know that's been a big barrier in Oregon. Um, and I also agree with the, um, uh, all the comments around the, the supervision. Um, I don't agree that, that practicum should be video only. Um, I think that people do need to be in person with the medicine and, um, whether it's, I, I think, you know, receiving and then sitting for someone is great. If it's just observation, that's also can be helpful, but, um, but not just video only. And it should be able to be counted if it's done in during the year. We find that if people do it like halfway through the year, they're, they're, um, they learn a lot. Um, and then finally, I would just say the um, a major thing I have uh, to comment on is just the areas of touch um, and the therapeutic touch. So we've been working in collecting data around touch for many years, and I, I will be publishing on it, but just really understanding what's beneficial for people and what's not. I do have a concern that having just hands and feet as um, where the therapist can or the facilitator can touch could be um, lead to some other detrimental effects, including harm um, because somebody was not able to be um, comforted if they are having a really distressing um, journey. Um, and some examples could be if someone is vomiting from psilocybin, I believe that they should be able to put their hand on, the facilitator should be able to put their hand on the person's back. Um, at Sound Mind, we have a, um, uh, and I'm also I'm the founder and director of Soundmind. I'm not sure I said that, but um, um, I, Dr. Levet, I, yeah. I apologize. I'm going to step in and, and cut okay. you off uh, yep. real quick. Uh, we can circle back to you. Um, okay, if sure. We have time, but we do have quite a few other folks with their hand raised. So I apologize, but uh, okay. I really appreciate your comments. Thank you. I so also much. have there's two ceremonial people coming on um, that will need translation that want to comment oh. about touch. They're Spanish speakers. Okay. Um, okay. And so they'll explain how to bring each other on. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, um, and uh, before I move on to the to the next uh, speakers, I did just want to let everybody know that, as you can see, we have um, uh, someone in the background sort of scrolling through, um, you know, sort of trying to keep what what we're speaking about on screen and and adding in comments as as they're able to. Um, but you know, things move fast. There's a lot of a lot of sections that we're we're looking at with these these proposed revisions. So. Just want to let you know that uh, your comments will will be captured. Like you know, we are recording this, and we will go back through um, at a later date, and you'll be able to see your comments um, in the in the written version um, online as well here over the next couple of days. So just let everybody know um, your your comments uh, will be um, you know made available for for everybody in the public to to take a look at. Um, also, uh, same thing for written comments. Any written comments that we receive uh, will be. Um, placed in here so for everybody to be able to, to see. Okay, um, let's see the next hand I have up. Uh, again, I will apologize for mispronouncing your name, but Amber Badia, uh, you are, should be able to unmute. Yeah, um, thank you minutes. very much. Yeah. Um, well, hello, thank you for, for the space. Um, I would like to translate for Paula Patino, which um, okay. she also has her hand raised. Let me, Paula Patino, yes. That's right. And uh, we would like to speak about the topic of touch also. 
Um, we okay. are both, um, we have collaborated with the Sound Mind Training Institute for some years, and we have ceremonial experience. Uh, I have studied with different ceremonial teachers and indigenous uh, lineages for over eight years. And um, Paula herself is a, an, she has an indigenous lineage and she works with different medicines. So we would like to address why the topic of touch is very important. So, um, Paula, can, can you hear me? ¿Me escuchas, Paula? Hola, sí, te escucho. Okay, uh, so I'm going to be translating for Paula. So, eh, Paula, ¿por qué consideras que el tema de poder tocar es importante? Poder tocar más que las manos y los pies. Hola, buenas, buenos días. Mucho gusto. Soy Paula Andrea Patiño. Trabajo con medicinas ancestrales. Hace aproximadamente 20 años y fui criada por abuelos curanderos, por chamanes. Eh, considero que es muy importante poder tener la, la oportunidad de tocar otras partes del cuerpo, como la espalda, la cabeza, eh, puede ser el pecho sobre las clavículas, porque estas son partes que generan seguridad, que van a dar... Eh, confort, confianza en un momento donde la persona el paciente puede estar pasando por un proceso de, eh, en la ceremonia o en la terapia donde necesita ser apoyada y eh, el hecho de poder tocar la espalda por ejemplo eso le va a dar a la persona seguridad le va a dar tranquilidad Okay, so uh, Paula is saying that she has over 20 years of experience working with medicines and she comes from a lineage of curanderos, of indigenous healers. And she's saying that she thinks it's very important to be able to touch at least the back, the head, and possibly the chest just below the clavicles because touching these areas of the body create a sense of safety for the person, especially if they are going through a very intense or tough process. Um, and even more so if they're in the process of purging. ¿Algo más, Paula, que, también, que quieras eh, comentar sobre esto? Sí, es muy importante también tener en cuenta que hay momentos donde la persona que está recibiendo la medicina puede estar pasando un proceso supremamente difícil donde esta persona no se puede levantar sola, necesita ir al baño, y es importante poder tener la facilidad de poderlo agarrar, de poderlo tomar de, de un brazo, del hombro, levantarlo. Si la persona está, por ejemplo, vomitando y está acostada, hay que moverla, hay que ayudarle a, mover, a moverse para que esté segura. De pronto, bronco, aspira si, si no hay alguien que la pueda mover o si el facilitador eh, tiene nervios de tocarla porque si la toca la pueden demandar o alguna cosa. Nosotros necesitamos como facilitadores tener la seguridad de que podemos tocar a la persona en ciertos momentos donde es importante por el bienestar mismo de la persona. Mm -hmm. So she's saying that um, it's also very important for facilitators to know that it is safe to touch the person when the person is going through a very intense process. Again, like if they're purging or the, if they need to go to the bathroom and they need to stand up, the facilitator must feel safe to hold the person and help that help them walk because if there is, if the facilitator is in fear of being sued then that is going to uh, interfere with the medicine process and uh, i just want to share that paula is indigenous from colombia so uh, she's just sharing her knowledge from um, the the tradition Excellent. Thank you both so much. I appreciate you taking the time to to come here and, and, and give your, your input, um, especially with the hurdle of having to translate. Really, really appreciate that, uh, both of you. Um, I did also want to just mention uh, really quick that um, uh, Lori, the program director, can uh, correct me if I'm uh, mistaken, but I do believe that the, the rules about touch um, in this context haven't been opened again for rulemaking. So um, not necessarily taking comments or looking at proposed revisions to that to those parts of the rules, um, but again, really appreciate um, you taking the time to come and, and share your your perspective. Thank you so much. 
Uh, next up, we have a couple of hands from folks who have already spoken, so I will circle back to you if we have time. But for now, I see Sean McAllister. You should be able to unmute. Please go ahead when you're ready, and you'll have three minutes. Hey, good morning, everybody. Sean McAllister, McAllister Law Office, one of the co-authors of Prop 122, consulted with hundreds of people around getting into this system, and we'll be training folks on the rules and uh, ethical requirements as part of other licensees training programs. Um, and so just uh, really appreciate the, the, the Dora's work and also all the comments of my friends and colleagues. I absolutely agree with Dr. Scott Shannon and Will Van Devere and Shannon Hughes and Tasha Poinsett and Hannah McQueen. And really, I haven't heard anything um, <clears throat> that I disagree with yet. So I echo those comments. A few specific comments. Uh, I think these are within today's scope. Um, Rule 6.3B13 only requires tracking outcome data if uh, the participant requires it. The concern is if adverse events are the only things reported and positive outcome data is not tracked, we'll have an unrepresentative reflection of the benefit of the system. And so I've always felt that uh, we should mandate outcome reporting and, and data tracking of outcomes uh, beyond just adverse events. I, I actually think the law requires that as part of the department's uh, ongoing reporting and uh, will require that for facilitators and healing centers to educate participants on the risks and benefits of the system. So I feel that that section should be broader um, and mandatory tracking outcome data. 6.3D um, requires three years, I'm sorry, D, uh, yeah, D, uh, three years of record keeping. Uh, this is longer than the DEA record keeping requirements for controlled substances, which is only two years. So I feel that this uh, record keeping period is too long and will be unduly burdensome and should be shortened to consistent with the DEA requirements for record keeping. A general requirement um, for all of these revisions is, you know, we're trying to train people on these rules and yet we're seeing continued revisions. I understand how difficult this is and appreciate your work, but we really encourage you to finish the work, finish the rules and allow for certainty in the buildup to applications at the end of the year. <clears throat> and that would include work on the safety screen which we're all waiting for a final version of to help incorporate into our practices, the code of ethics, um, which is gonna be important, you know, for several of these requirements. Um, for example, um, several different documentations that are required or safety screens or treatment plans, to the extent the state could provide model forms uh, prior to completion of rulemaking so that, um, yeah, I see that time's up. Let me just finish. It just would really reduce the burden on people and actually put me out of work because otherwise they're going to have to pay people like me to do um, all these plans and disclosures and forms. So to the extent you can uh, provide model forms, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for your, for your comments. Um, we have quite a few other hands raised, so let's keep moving right along. Uh, next up is uh, Ingmar Gorman. You should be able to unmute. Please go ahead. Hi. Thank you. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak and share my perspective here. I am the co-founder and CEO of Fluence, which was previously mentioned by Dan McCombie, uh, and I'm also a clinical psychologist by training. I've served as a study therapist and co-principal investigator of phase two and phase three studies of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD. And I've also served as a study therapist in the trial of psilocybin for uh, major depressive disorder. At Fluence, uh, we've trained study therapists for psychedelic pharmaceutical companies in clinical trials of psilocybin, 5-MeO, DMT, and other compounds. And I've also co-authored literature on the subject of psychedelic harm reduction and integration, which emphasizes the importance of preparation and integration in therapy. 
So with this in mind, uh, I would like to advocate for allowing preparation and integration to fully count towards the practicum experience required. Uh, these aspects of psychedelic therapy are considered equally valuable as the administration of the psychedelic substance itself. And I wanted to go on the record to express my agreement uh, as similar to the previous speaker um, uh, with the points raised by Scott Shannon, Will Vanderveer, uh, many others who um, I don't know as well, but I also just want to comment that I see a lot of agreement. I just want to be on the, the record for that um, with particular focus on the training and practicum requirements and supervision with particular concern to the, uh, the length of the practicum and also the required training hours. Um, also, some really insightful comments by uh, Jimmy Smurs, who I've uh, not had the pleasure of uh, meeting yet. And that's all I wanted to share. I want to yield my time back and again, just expressing support for what has been mentioned previously. Great, thank you so much. I really appreciate your comments. Uh, next up, we have hand raised, uh, uh, I will uh, apologize uh, for mispronouncing your name, I'm sure, but Bereen Majewska, uh, you should be able to speak. Please go ahead when you're able. Enjoy Hi, thanks. Um, you, you can hear me, right? Yep. OK, um, great. Yeah, your, your pronunciation wasn't that far off. My name is Bereen Majewska. I'm an attorney at the law firm of Vicente. And um, first, I wanted to thank you guys for all your ongoing effort on these rules. Um, I think they're very nuanced. There's a lot of detail. And I know that many people in the community appreciate how hard you guys have been working. Um, we work with a lot of folks that are putting in a lot of their own effort and sincerity and trying to operate within these rules. So the few comments I have today will reflect some of the confusions and concerns that we are hearing from them as they try to get their businesses going within this regulatory model. Uh, first, people are unclear about exactly where natural medicine services can be provided. So to that point, we suggest that authorized locations should be a defined term and ideally would include private residences, healing centers, um, any locations where training programs conduct uh, practicums and, um, and also any therapist offices or other professional offices where a facilitator could reasonably provide these types of services. Um, so we suggest that that just be a defined term, be added to the regs, and then ideally the practicum sites allowed would also be at these same um, authorized locations. Um, and then my second point is there are practical concerns that have been voiced by many people on the call today and otherwise that about getting students in Colorado the appropriate practicums, especially early on. And if the 30 required hours don't include observation, then the training programs won't be able to rely on the Oregon practicums to fulfill the Colorado requirements. And I think we as a community want to be able to re rely on Oregon, especially now in these early days where there's limited access and infrastructure. So I think the Oregon experience in allowing our students to have their practicum requirements met through Oregon experience will be a great resource for us at this stage. So we recommend, I recommend, I ask that you guys consider um, that observation of facilitation um, rather than the current language, which I believe says assisting facilitation, which would not be permitted in Oregon. Um, so we recommend, I ask that the observation of facilitation count towards those 30 hours. And then my third and final comment for now is to echo many folks who have said this before me, having only a six month window to complete the 50 hours of consultation seems unworkable. So ideally that would be two years. And I think that would be in line with the rest of the regs. Are you guys still able to hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, my phone just asked me to unmute. Um, so yeah, so six months seems unreasonable for those 50 hours of consultation. So I'd ask that you guys consider two years for that, which I think would be in line with a lot of the rest of the regulations around the trading license. Um, and that's all I have for now. Thank you for your time and your efforts here. Thank you so much, as always. Uh, next up, I see Lisa Ginsberg. You should be able to unmute. Please go ahead when you're ready, you'll have three minutes. Hi, everyone. My name is Lisa Ginsberg. I'm the founder of Changa Institute. Uh, we're currently facilitating cohort of students in Colorado. And I would like to advocate for students to be able to complete partially hours while they're completing their training. I think 
uh, that can work for preparation when they go on over the forums and po potential integration. I also uh, agree about the six month um, for consultation. I think it's unreasonable, especially for young facilitators. And I, I would like to advocate for alternative practicum, at least for the first year for the students uh, who are going through the first set of programs that just launched and service centers are not available and asking people to fly to Oregon to complete the practicum, um, I don't think it's viable. And um, I also think that alternative practicums potentially can offer better experiences especially going and role-playing over adverse reactions. Uh, if facilitators are asked to observe sessions, most of the se sessions happening fairly in a safe environment and um, adverse reactions are not as common. And I think observing a couple of sessions will not provide much experience to facilitators, especially those who are new to the field. Uh, aside from that, thank you so much for working hard. Uh, putting all this together. Uh, thank you for Dora and everyone who's involved. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. Uh, very appreciated as with everyone's. Let's see, up next. Uh, and we are running uh, out of our, uh, at least uh, allotted time, although we will keep, keep going since we have some folks with their hands raised who've been waiting for a while. Uh, next up we have, again, I apologize for mispronouncing your name. Uh, Dana Tisconea uh, Starbird. Please unmute when you're ready and you'll have three minutes. Hi, thanks. I'm Dana Tisconea Starbird. I am a somatic art therapist and a body worker. I was a MDMA sub investigator for MAPS on MT1. And I'd like to comment about um, e echoing all the comments that were made previous. I agree with basically most of them. And I really would encourage you to consider trainings that people have had with the MDMA and with the ketamine as those are done in a psychedelic model. And so the, the trainings there definitely relate and carry over to psilocybin. Um, I am concerned with the 200 hours as well um, and uh, providing documented hours for beginning uh, licensure, especially for underground therapists who did not keep track of their clients due to legality issues and not wanting to have any records available. Um, uh, I would suggest that perhaps that if the underground people want to come up a board that maybe they have three letters of recommendations from people that they have sat with. Um, that could be a viable uh, alternative. Um, I also want to echo what Amber and Paula said about the sense of safety and touch and how important of being able to have that touch. Um, and I know that you're not covering that, but I want to echo how very important that that is and being able to touch in other areas. And as a body worker, um, just even being able to touch in on the chest, like people sometimes want you just to hold their heart or to hold their stomach where they, they're having uh, a lot of emotional stuff going on and that helps to ground them and helps them to feel safe. So that is very, very important. Um, I also agree with Lisa on the alternative practicum and considering like all the role playing that people have had in their trainings, um, preparation and integration should definitely be considered um, as mostly that's what people have been doing because of the legal uh, issues over the country. Um, let's see. And I think that that, oh, and the the 40 hour practicum, um, the comments that Dan made, um, I agree with. And I agree with the uh, Shannon Hughes with the retreat sites for practicum. And I am complete, thank you. Great, thank you so much. Appreciate your comments as always. 
let's see, we are, we are nearing the end of our scheduled time. Um, so we might not have time to circle back to folks who have already spoken, but we do have some, some folks with their hands raised who haven't yet had a chance to speak. So we will keep going ahead with uh, Josh Kappel. Joshua, excuse me, um, you should be able to unmute. Please go ahead, you'll have three minutes. Hey, thank, thank you very much, Nate. My name is Josh Kappel. I'm with Vicente LLP, also a senior policy advisor for the Healing Advocacies Fund. Um, you know, first, I want to like thank you, know, you Nate, and all of you know all of Dora's team for like continuing to like work on this program and continuing to make it better. Um, I really appreciate you know permitting the practicum to start halfway through the didactic. I think that's you know really good and shows. Um, you know, listening, you know, to the community there. And I also really appreciate like the removal of some redundancy in the rules. I think the more we can streamline these rules, the more operable they are. Um, a couple of preliminary items and I have some like specific changes. Um, I do believe touch is open. The notice of rule says 6.6 um, .6 is open, um, you know, for revisions and 6.6 .6 is titled use of physical touch. Um, you know, so it does seem, you know, from the notice that that is like a fair topic for the public to talk about. And I do want to echo and support all the comments around touch that these overly restrictive rules we have for touch actually create a less safe program um, for the reasons you heard. Um, you know, I also, <clears throat> you know, as a preliminary matter too, I would really um, respectfully ask that Dora continue to update these rules. I know there's changes to these rules that happen with the advisory board and the subcommittee and, you know, for the public to know what changes the department is thinking about it or has already accepted um, allows us to provide more efficient written comments, you know, focused on what hasn't been changed or what those revisions are. And so, you know, I know in the past, you know, you've updated the rules, you know, right before the final rulemaking hearing and just like a respectful request, like update that, you know, like maybe a week or two before or continuously to allow us like provide you more efficient feedback. Um, you know, big picture, I mean, I really, you know, support like more clarity of these rules and not complicating things. And the requirement that a consultant have two hour, hundred hours of experience of natural medicine experience just doesn't work for the first, for the beginning of the program because there is no natural medicine services. There won't be natural medicine services for at least six months after we have licensed trained facilitators. So also like limiting the consultation period to six months it just doesn't work. Um, so those need to be changed or they need to be like grandfathered in. Like it's good intentions, but like, hey, maybe we do these things, you know, later on, you know, 2026, 2027, even though the consultation period should be longer than six months regardless. Um, you know, also like the ongoing consultation requirement step in the right direction for sure. This seems like really burdensome and we should probably like build in um, continuing education credits to this and cut down the hours as well. Um, the practicum rules um, just need a lot more flexibility. As Barina mentioned, if you require co-facilitating, you've all of a sudden taken out Oregon service centers. Um, the rules that say like any licensed healing center can serve as a practicum site implies that nowhere else can serve as a practicum site. And so I think you want, um, you know, clinical, um, you know, you know, clinical research sites, you want Oregon sites, you want international, um, you know, and then likewise, um, I know I'm out of time, but just real quickly, um, you know, I do think we should change the dosing to reflect organs, um, you know, dosing requirements, and then also the authorized locations. There's confusion around authorized locations, and I echo what everyone said around authorized locations. And overall, like, echo what everyone said. Um, yeah, overall, I just echo all the comments so far. You know, they were all, you know, very thoughtful and really, you know, really support those. And then there's, you know, we have more specifics, but it seems like we're out of time. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. Um, and uh, I, you know, it looks like I may have misspoken about what was actually included in the notice here, as you pointed out. Um, so I, I stand corrected. I, I apologize for, for misspeaking. Um, and thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, it's uh, very helpful. That's why uh, we trust you all to help us help us get this right. Um, and uh, we are at the end of our scheduled time, but we do have one um, one person who has their hand raised who's been waiting for a while. So Leslie Fries, uh, please go ahead. You will be our, our last speaker um, today and uh, you will have three minutes. Please go ahead. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, thanks for all the effort. Um, um, my name is Leslie Fries. I'm the founder and CEO of Sock Debt and Sock Debt Farms. Uh, I want to echo what uh, 
most people have been saying um, around the six month window to get all your hours in is a little bit short, um, two years. Um, I think that's plenty of time, uh, maybe too much. Um, I also agree that physical touch is extremely important, not only for providing a, a safer experience, but also uh, possibly a um, heightened experience. Um, I think with uh, there's a lot of correlation between neuromuscular um, uh, aspects and uh, psychedelics that could be utilized, uh, even uh, with massage. Um, I, I don't I don't know how that should be laid out, but I, I just want to emphasize that I think physical touch is important. Um, I do disagree with something that someone stated in regards for um, having your ketamine hours um, count or um, or whatnot. Um, I, I see those as different medicines, different energies, and different experiences, and I think those things should be separated. Um, but that's all I have. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much uh, for your comments, and I appreciate you waiting around um, till the very end to, to have your voice heard. Um, I just wanted to, uh, as we wrap up here, just really thank you all for taking the time to come out uh, this morning and, and have your, your opinions heard. Um, I know it's an invaluable resource, um, you all as stakeholders, for us to, to get these things right and to make sure that um, we are able to, to make regulations that, that work for everybody. Um, so with that, I will say, you know, we do have a couple of folks with their hands still up. I didn't know if you were still waiting to, to speak again or not, but we are unfortunately out of time. However, there will be I'll, I'll go over this here in a second. Um, so, you know, you'll, of course, have opportunity to send in, in written comments um, as well. So um, with that, I uh, will wrap us up today. Uh, thank you so much for participating in today's meeting. As part of this collaborative process, all comments and program recommendations will be provided to the director uh, for review before the next meeting on October 11th, 2024. Any proposed revisions by the director will be made available to stakeholders for additional comments prior to the rulemaking hearing, which is tentatively scheduled for November 6th, 2024. All rulemaking information can be found on the program's website under the public notices tab, and written comments may be sent to Dora underscore DPO underscore rulemaking at state.co.us. Again, that email address is Dora, D-O-R-A underscore DPO underscore rulemaking at state .co.us. That concludes this stakeholder meeting. Thank you again for your participation.